Salutations, everybody, and welcome to Collider Mailbag, the all-mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your mailbag questions, and it's Sunday, probably watching this video during halftime, during one of the football games, whatever. Where I'm at is I'm going to be down at the, at the Los Angeles Convention Center later today at 3 p.m. for our Collider Movie Talk panel at Stanley's Kamikaze at the LA Convention Center. If you're in Los Angeles and you're watching this in time, Come on down and join us and uh, come and meet us, me and the crew there. It's going to be a lot of fun. Now, this is Mailbag where, you know, we it's a, it's a lot more relaxed. It's a lot more casual than the, you know, movie talk we do Monday through Friday. We take your questions. Now, I'm doing the Mailbags alone this weekend because, like, most of the crew is down at Kamikaze. So I'm going to be flying solo this weekend. Um, but we take questions about anything. You can ask about movie questions. You can ask about behind-the-scenes questions about, you know, how we run everything. Or you can even ask some television questions if you like, because we're covering TV now too as well, to a to a smaller degree, but we're covering a little bit of TV. So with all that out of the way, let's get into the first question of the day. And the first question today comes to us from Ab hmm, Ab Hinov Ab Hinov Tik, uh, Tiku. So uh, forgive me if I'm butchering your name. I'm doing the best I can. Um, Hi, Collider Movie Talk. Huge fan and keep up the great work. Well, thank you so much. Um, given the recent surge of interest in post credit scenes through Marvel advertising and films, do you think it is possible that Star Wars Episode 7 will follow that similar route in order to prep audiences for Episode 8? If so, is it a possibility that Luke will not appear in the main film at all, but instead in a post credit scene to hype up the next one in the trilogy? Thanks and keep up the great work. Well, thanks a lot for the question. And, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, will there be a post credit scene in Star Wars Episode Seven? I believe there will be. Um, because not just to follow the trend. Uh, I mean, and yes, and remember, so a lot of people, for some reason, think that Marvel created the post credit scene. They did not. post credit scenes have been around a long time. Uh, not popular, but they've been around. Marvel certainly popularized the uh, the notion of post credit scenes, and and that's cool. Um, but the question is, will Star Wars do that? Will Star Wars have a post credit scene for you know their upcoming movies and stuff like that? They've got Rogue One coming, Episode Eight, Han Solo, Episode Nine. They got a lot of movies coming. So will Star Wars do it? I believe the answer is yes. I do believe they will. I believe it's a missed opportunity if they don't. Um, I mean, it's part of Disney as well, so they like doing that over there. But I don't think they should pump Episode 8. I think they should pump Rogue One. I think they should do that. I think, you know, the credits roll for about 30 seconds. Because, you know, a lot of post-credits scenes these days aren't at the very end of the credits. or about 30 seconds or a minute into the credits. So they're called mid credit scenes. I think maybe about 30 seconds of the scenes into the credits, screen should go dark and come up and say... 40 years ago or 45 years ago, whatever it was, whatever the era, I think it's 30 years ago or 35 years ago, and then give a little tease, a post-credit tease of Rogue One. I think that would be cool. I think that would be the right way to go. Now, as far as your question is, do we think that we might not see Luke in the movie at all until a post-credit scene? I don't think so. I think... You know, you're they're bringing out Mark Hamill on stage at Star Wars Celebration. Um, he's doing interviews and stuff like that. I believe he is in properly in Star Wars Episode Seven. I don't think he's showing up till the third act, but I do believe, and it's going to be some big reveal. But I do believe he's in the movie, and they won't actually hold off until Episode uh, 8 for him to finally make his appearance or for a post credit scene for him to actually make his appearance. It's an interesting idea, but I think everything we've seen so far points to him being in the movie proper, so I think that's the way they're going to go. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Joseph Bartlett, who writes, Hello, Clyder movie crew. When a big movie like Star Wars sells out, can theaters cut back on available showings of other movies? Or are they contractually obligated to give a certain number of screens to other movies? Keep up the great work. Well, I think that is a great question, Joseph. And it was so good, I actually wrote to uh, a PR guy for one of the big theater chains. And I put that question to them because I have my opinion about it, but I wanted their question. 
And I just got like a politician's answer. I mean, it was a, it was a big long paragraph that didn't say anything. It basically didn't answer the question at all. So let me tell you what I think. Okay. Um, having worked in a theater chain for a while, for a while until recently, uh, I have an opinion about this. This is the way I believe it works. Yes. Movie theaters can bump other movies out of their theater to make room for another movie that is selling out like crazy. Now, I've told this story before, but going back a couple of years on the opening night of the first Avengers movie, we were at and doing some coverage at the AMC Burbank 16, okay? And Clark Gregg was there with me, actually the guy who plays Agent Coulson in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and in the Avengers movies. Um, so Clark Gregg was there with me. He and I were running back, like in between all the theaters that were showing the movie it was and surprising the audience with him being there. It was a lot of fun. But... Um, but I remember that night, I believe Avengers in the AMC Burbank 16, which has 16 screens, duh. Um, I believe it was showing on six screens. But by 11 o'clock, because the first screening was at midnight, by 11 o'clock, or maybe by like 10.30, it expanded to seven or eight screens because all the other screens had sold out. Then it expanded to nine or 10. Then it expanded to about 11. And then by the time midnight hit, every single damn theater in the AMC Burbank 16 was showing Avengers. That's what it was showing. So, we know that a theater can bump other films out. Now, you bring up a great thing, a question in the email about contractual obligations. I've got to believe that in these contracts, there are probably provisions in the contract that where a movie theater says, hey, if we have like an opening night situation or a, a situation where a movie is selling out every single show and your movie is not exceeding 30% capacity or is not exceeding 25% capacity or whatever, then we reserve the right to bump your film out and maybe give you additional screenings later. So the way I believe it works, and correct me if I'm wrong if you know this differently, and I know a lot of you guys who watch this show actually work in movie theater, so tell me what you know, but it would seem to me that let's say... Um, Star Wars The Force Awakens was opening and that new Tina Fey and Amy Poehler movie Sisters is opening, right? And Tina Fey, the Amy Poehler on opening night has sold 10% of their seats, right? But every screening of Star Wars is all sold out. So the movie theater wants to bump Sisters out and put in another thing of Star Wars, which makes sense because if they can get another, sell another 400 tickets for that theater that's right now only has like 38 tickets sold, uh, for sisters, <clears throat> that makes sense. And then what I think would probably would be in that contract says, okay, but we will then compensate that movie by giving it an additional screening the next day or giving it an additional screen or giving it an extra day or something like that. Once again, keep in mind, I, th that is my hypothesis, okay? Because I've seen big movies bump out small movies. I've seen it happen. So it does happen. The question is, what are the mechanisms that then kick into place and how does the theater compensate, you know, the other movie that's getting bumped? I'm just speculating, but I got to think it's it's by giving them additional screen times on other days. They, and I think it's a great question. So once again, any of you guys work in the movie theater industry, jump in the comments section. You know, and that's what I love about our comments section, okay? The collective knowledge of the 30, 40,000 people who are watching this particular episode of Mailbag the collective knowledge is so much greater than one idiot sitting in front of the camera, right? So by all means, jump, utilize the comment section. If, and if you're wondering about something, look through the comment section, see if somebody else has an answer or something like that. That is the great thing about this whole movie um, collider video thing being a community is that we all get to share our experience and knowledge. So by all means, I hand it over to you, the community. Jump in the comment section. Let me know what you know about this whole situation of bigger movies bumping out smaller movies on high capacity days. It'd be great, it'd be great to see your input. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Chris. And Chris writes, Hi, been watching the show for over six months now and I'm addicted to every show. Well, thanks so much, Chris. Great to have you on board. I heard a while ago that Steven Spielberg's Jaws is getting a remake. Do you know any more on this? And what are your thoughts? Thanks and keep up the awesome work. Well, okay, this much I know. There was for a while, and I'm just going to pull something up here on the internet while we're talking. Um, there was for a while... A, some talk and some, some discussion um, <clears throat> about 
you know, a couple of classic films like Back to the Future or Jaws or things like that. But in particular, for a couple of years now, there has been rumblings, and I've heard them as well, that the studios may be looking at Jaws. And by the way, guys, I know it's an old film, but if you have not seen the original Jaws, you're just screwing yourself because you are screwing yourself out of an awesome movie experience. It doesn't even have to be on the big screen, but watch it on the biggest screen you can. That first original Jaws film directed by Steven Spielberg, one of the all-time greats. Watch it. It's intense. It's 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 funny at the same time in the midst of all this. It's just, just watch it. It's incredible. Go, stop what you're doing. Stop watching Mailbag. You don't need to listen to me. Hit pause, jump on some online streaming service, find where you can get your hands on Jaws and watch Jaws. Then come back. Okay, you back? All right. Wasn't that awesome? Wasn't that movie awesome? Anyway, there's been speculation and rumblings for a while now that, that a studio has been interested. But honestly, I've never heard anything credible about any movie or any movement on it at all. I actually don't think it's happening. Um, and it's not because Jaws is too classic to remake. You know my opinion. I don't think any, I don't think anything's out of bounds to remake. Because if you do a remake and it sucks, who cares? We still have the original. It doesn't hurt anything at all to put out a bad remake. It, there's no downside to making a bad remake. And sometimes we get movies that are better than the originals. Like... Um, John Carpenter's The Thing, that's a remake. Like The Fly, that was a remake. I mean, it, it happens. But um, I think the reason, though, why no one's really going to be looking at Jaws, and I'm sure there's some legal issues as well, but there have been a few shark movies in the past 15 years. And ain't none of them have done very well. I mean, they've done okay. But a lot of them have been, like, just terrible. Um, I think one, let me just look this up. I think there was one called Shark Night. Yeah, there was a movie called Shark Night. Oh my God, yeah, and it was awful. I remember they had like 30 different types of sharks and it was just, uh, it was terrible. Anyway, um, so I think it has more of the fact to do with that shark movies just aren't hot. And actually they're considered a joke. I mean, especially with Asylum's Sharknado, right? Which, well, how successful has that been for such a low budget thing? Um, <clears throat> it's more considered like parody now, shark movies. So... I have not heard any reputable information about there being any movement, and I don't expect, this is just me guessing though, I mean, who knows, it may, but I, I'm guessing that we're probably not going to see one for a long time. All right, thanks a lot for the question. Let's move on to the next one. And the next one today comes to us from Colin Vanderberg, who writes, Greetings, movie talkers. I've been a devoted fan for a couple of years now, and I'm absolutely hooked. Well, thank you so much, Colin. Really appreciate that. I saw The Gift a few months ago. Thanks, mainly due to your recommendations. Awesome movie, right? Um, I was blown away by it. I was particularly impressed by Joel Edgerton's direction. For a first-time director, he really knocked it out of the park. My question is this. Has Edgerton expressed any interest in working behind the camera again? He did such a great job on The Gift, and I'd be very curious to see him direct another film. What do you guys think? Will or should Joel Edgerton continue directing, or do you think he'll just stick to acting? Great question. The Gift is one of those movies that caught all of us completely by surprise. Because I'll be honest with you, I thought the marketing was bad. I, I, I didn't get it. It looked kind of like a paint-by-the-numbers, um, almost TV movie of the week thrillers to me in the marketing. But, but then the first couple of people I know to see really advanced screenings of it came back and go, John, you got to see The Gift. I'm like, really? And then I saw it and like, wow, I really enjoy the film. Might be in my top 10 of the year right now. Um, not positive about that, but it might be in my top 10 of the year as of right now. It's just such a, for her, a low budget, first time director, all that kind of stuff. Very simple looking movie. It just delivered. And I give a lot of the credit to the direction of the film. You're right. Joel Edgerton did a great job. And, you know, when I when I first saw that question, I went and looked and said, well, what else has he got lined up? As of right now, Joel Edgerton has nothing else lined up to direct. So, and the funny thing, too, is I haven't really heard him talk much about his experience directing the film. I've heard him talk a lot about the movie, but I haven't heard him talk a lot about his experience of directing the film. 
Now, directing can be a totally different situation, man, because everybody just sees the director's chair as the chair of power. But the director's chair is also the chair of obligations and responsibility. And sometimes the obligation, the workload, and responsibility, that's not for everybody. And I know some actors who have tried directing and gone, okay, no, no, okay, I'm going to go back to acting. You know, that sort of thing. So I've got to imagine... Not only because of how good the gift was, but how much money the gift made. I've got to imagine that there are studios lining up projects to offer to Joel Edgerton to direct. But as of right now, officially anyway, he has no other films lined up to direct. And I haven't heard him talk about it. So I think it would be a shame if he does not direct more. I have to believe he's going to take another crack at it because the first one was so successful. And he's got clearly got an eye for it and clearly has a talent for it. So... Have we heard anything? Is there anything on the horizon? Officially, no, there's not. But I really hope he does because I'd love to see what he does next. All right, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Cal Thomas, who writes, Hi, guys. I love the show. I've been watching for almost two years now. Well, thanks so much, Cal. I'm really a big fan. Question. With the announced Shazam movie coming up in 2019, what are your thoughts about additional casting aside from The Rock? I think Warner missed an opportunity to cast Joe Manganiello as Superman. I think he would have been an I, I think he would have been ideal had the tone and direction uh, of the shared universe been different. With that being said, what do you guys think about him being Shazam? Uh, would he or being being Shazam? Oh yeah, being being Shazam. He would always be in superhero mode without the secret identity issues, and I think he could run with it. Well, thanks a lot for the question. Um. First of all, I am a big Joe Manganiello fan. Uh, we actually had him in our studio uh, a while back, back when he did that movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger last year, and I'm forgetting the name of it off the top of my head. But we had him in studio. Such a pleasant guy. Such a nice guy. He was, like, really cool, came in, like, very responsive and very attentive and just a really cool guy. You'd think you, you think you get something a little edgier out of him, but... He's just a really nice guy. And I love seeing him when he pops up in movies. However, should he have been Superman? Hell no. No, no, that's just not a good fit. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned in your email, Cal, is you say, like, I think it would have been a great Superman if the tone had been different and the story had been different. Well, that brings up an issue that I, I have with, you know, you've heard me say this a lot of times. You don't base your movie around the actor. You get the best actor to fit your movie. Um, you know, say... You don't start with saying, hey, let's get Joe Manganiello to be Superman and then build your whole movie around that. You, you don't do that. You come up with the movie you want and then you go out and you get yourself the actor who you think will best complement that and fit into that. And that's that's always for me the magic word, right? Fit. If you had a nickel for every time you heard me say fit, um, you'd all be rich. But it's all about the best fit. <clears throat> and for that Man of Steel movie, Joe Manganiello wouldn't have been the right fit. There are other roles he would have been much better for. The role of Superman, not so much. The role of Shazam, however, it's difficult to think of fit right now because we don't know what direction that movie's going. I, I have no idea what the tone is and what the character's supposed to be like. So if they want a really gentle, aw shucks kind of guy, then Joe Manganiello is not that. If you want a more square jaw, sterner um, Shazam, then Joe Manganiello maybe becomes your guy. If if that's the direction your movie's going, if it's a different Shazam, doesn't fit. If it is that kind of Shazam, it becomes a fit. But you always start with what the movie is. So it's really, really difficult for any of us to say, you know who would be a good Shazam? This guy. It's almost impossible because right now we don't know what Shazam means. Like, when you say, who would make a good Superman? Well, what Superman are you talking about? Are you talking about a little more grounded reality kind of Superman? Are you talking about a Superman who's an, oh, gosh, gee, golly, miss, I'll go save your kitten from that tree? Are you talking about a more brooding Superman? Are you talking more of a, of a wonderment Superman? Like, when you just say Shazam, what are we saying? We don't know yet what this incarnation is going to be like or what they're aiming for. So it's kind of tough. Now, that being said, if tomorrow Warner Brothers announced, we have our co-star along with The Rock and it's going to be Joe Manganiello Shazam, I'll go, cool. Because then I think that gives us some insight into what direction they're going with the character. I still believe, and I'm probably totally wrong about this, I believe 
And again, I am probably totally wrong. I'm basing this on nothing but pure speculation. I still think The Rock is playing Black Adam and Shazam. I'm thinking they're going to set up where they, they, the source of their power is the same, and they are the same guy when they transform. I think The Rock is playing both Black Adam and Shazam. Probably totally wrong about that. We will totally see what thing comes. That's my totally speculation-based, no foundation, in fact, guess is, is that. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. All right, let's go on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Jeremy Ramirez, who writes, Hi, guys. I'm a huge fan, and I love the show and all of you. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. With the introduction of Wally West on The Flash, talking about the TV series here, do you think that he might get his own spinoff in a couple of years or take over the Flash mantle from Barry? In the, in the pilot, Wells has the newspaper from 2024 that says, Flash vanishes in crisis. So, do, so could that mean some adaptation of Crisis on Infinite Earth will be coming and Wally could become the Flash? Or do you think he spins off and does a Teen Titans show if TNT is still moving forward? What do you think of it? Well, uh, don't even think about the Wally West we have on the Flash on CW who is coming. Um, is going to then go over and be Teen Titan on TNT. They, they don't, different networks don't share universes. They, they just don't. They're on two separate networks. They don't share the same universe. Now, and that's why you have Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on ABC that is so, where's Thor? I've got to go to Asgard. I know Tony Stark. Uh, I We've got to get uh, 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 Natasha in here. Uh, if only Hawkeye were around. That, what do you think that is? Some kind of magic Asgardian hammer? I know Odin. I mean, just blatant, overt references to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? They're, all the references in Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. are blatant and overt, right? It's all, it, to the point that I've criticized the show because they hit you over the head with it. It's like, you know, I I could just give a call to Tony and see if he can come as Iron Man and save the day. I mean, they just, they just say, Bleh. there it is. It, they're so blatant and overt. On the contrary... When you look at Daredevil on Netflix, all their references are hints and very thinly veiled references. They don't say the alien invasion of New York. You know, they never said that. They never once mentioned an alien invasion of New York. They simply said, I think, the Battle of New York once. They dropped that phrase once. Um and then, I, like a, that one time in a, in a, a newspaper office, on one of the somebody, one of our readers pointed this out to me because I didn't even see it the first time. And one of our readers pointed out to me that on the office wall in like the the newspaper offices, in the back, if you look closely, there's a picture of the Leviathan that the Hulk brought down. Remember, that? Boom, the whole Leviathan came down. There's a picture of that on the wall. So there are references to Daredevil and the larger. Marvel Universe, but they are so thin, they're so veiled, and they're so obscure, and they're sh so subtle um, <clears throat> that you have to look for them. You have to search for them. Whereas in Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., it's Iron Man, Thor, where's uh, where's Director Fury, and, and all this kind of stuff. It's because you're not going to see Coulson pop up on Daredevil. You're not going to see... Um, and as Guardian pop up in Jessica Jones, you're not going to see those types of things. So while on Netflix, they will kind of thinly reference this, you're never going to see Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. reference Daredevil. You're never going to see Daredevil reference Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, so they're, they're different things. Now, getting back to the main question here is like Wally West could, will CW then take Wally West and then he goes over to TNT and is on Teen Titans. I, I really, I'll be, I'll be really shocked. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible, but let's put this. I'd be seriously, seriously shocked. And could Wally take over the mantle for Barry? Nah, Grant Gustin is beloved. Everybody loves that actor. He's done such a great job as the Flash. CW has no intention of replacing uh, Grant Gustin as the Flash with somebody else playing, even if it's a Wally West character. I don't. I don't think they do. I'll be surprised if they do. I'll. I'll be really, really surprised. But as I said. Anything's possible, right? I, stranger things have happened. So let's keep our eyes on it. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Ike Moore. And Ike writes, Hey, Collider crew, big fan of the show. 
With the announcements of Chris Rock hosting the Oscars and Ricky Gervais hosting the Golden Globes, who do you think will do the better job, and do you think the two will try to outdo each other? Thanks, and bring on the filthy. Um, I am a big fan of both of these guys. I love Ricky Gervais. Chris Rock, I, I mentioned this on Movie Talk. For me personally, and comedy is so subjective, for me personally, if I was putting together a Mount Rushmore of the, the best all-time pure stand-up comedians, I would have Chris Rock, Chris Rock on my Mount Rushmore. Chris Rock would be one of the guys uh, in my top four of all time. I, I just his stand up is so uh, it's just so intelligent. I mean, some people don't realize how brutally intelligent Chris Rock is. He's not just some red red f and this blah, 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 comedian, which we see a lot of them. Chris Rock kind of delivers a lot of stuff in that shell, but underneath the surface, he's so freaking smart and observant and makes incredible allegories and things like that when he's doing his stuff. He's, he's just great. Now, I'm a little bit apprehensive. I said this on the show. I'm apprehensive about him hosting the Oscars because he did host the Oscars before, and I didn't think he did a very good job. I mean, hosting the Oscars and doing straight-up stand-up comedy are two different things. So, but, you know, color me intrigued. I'm, I'm intrigued to see it. I believe Chris Rock is the better stand-up comedian out of the two. But I do think Ricky Gervais will do a better job hosting the Golden Globes than Chris Rock will do hosting the Oscars. Um, for a couple of reasons. Ricky Gervais sees, just seems way more comfortable in the hosting role. He's got way more experience at it because he hosted the Golden Globes like three years in a row. And he's hosted other things as well. Uh, he's killed it when he's done it. And the Golden Globes is a much more loose show. You can, you can take more liberties on a Golden Globe show than the, the more formal Oscars. Now, I believe the Oscars are 5,000 times more relevant and 5,000 times more important than the Golden Globes, absolutely. But as far as just the show goes, Golden Globes kicks the Oscars' ass, in my opinion. That's just, just my opinion. Um, and there'll be a, a few more restrictions on, say, a Chris Rock doing the Oscars and there will be on a Ricky Gervais. Will the two try to outdo each other? No, because I think it's a little bit of apples and oranges. I, I don't think one will have any reflection on the other. But while I have Chris Rock on my Mount Rushmore of all-time great comedians, and I think he's the better comedian, I think Ricky Gervais is going to absolutely crush it. I think he has a history of crushing it. So I believe Ricky Gervais will do the better job. But we'll see what happens um, after uh, February or March or whenever the Oscars are this year. All right, now let's move on to the last question of the day. And the final question today comes to us from Riel Gaither, who writes, Remember when movies had to leave the theater and then get a VHS release? I can understand film to tape transfer, but it's 2015. Why do movies still leave the theater and are released months later on Blu-ray? Didn't Steven Soderbergh release a movie on a theater, on DVD, and streaming at the same time? What happened with that? Well, thanks a lot for the question, Real. And <clears throat> basically, here's the issue. The issue is not how long does it take to get a movie onto Blu-ray or onto DVD or on streaming. They could do that overnight. That's not the issue. The issue is the relationship between the studios and the movie theaters. And the movie theaters and the studios have an agreement. That's what they call the, the theatrical window, okay? It's like, okay, a movie comes out in theaters, and now there is a window of time. It's always been three months. I mean, it used to be longer than three months. It's down to about three months now. Maybe a little bit shorter, maybe a little bit longer. Where a movie theater says, okay, we will show your movie in our movie theaters, but you have to honor... That theatrical window, that for argument's sake right now, let's say three months, you have to honor that three-month window that the only place somebody can see this movie is in theaters. <laughs> because if, and first of all, look, I said this when I was working it at AMC. I said it long before I ever worked at AMC. Go look at my old stuff on the movie blog a decade before I ever worked at AMC theaters, okay? I've always said this. Doesn't matter how good you think your home theater system is. Nothing is as good as watching a movie in a movie theater. Plain, simple, end of statement. That being said, there, 
you know, if you're a movie theater chain, it's like, why will we invest our money and our energy in putting a movie on our screens and staff it and pay the bills and have our structure and all that kind of stuff? Why would we do that for your movie if you're just going to put the movie out on Blu-ray two weeks later? Because there's going to be a number of people who maybe would have come to the movie theater to see the movie, but now they think, yeah, I'll just wait two weeks and then I'll watch it on Blu-ray and, and, and home video. So why? what's the incentive then for the movie theater to want to put your movie on their screens? There's not. There has to be an exclusive window where if you want us to show these movies on our screens, you have to guarantee us a certain window of time before you release it for home video consumption. And quite frankly... Me personally, I've always felt this. I think the window should be bigger. I think there should be a five or six month window between when a movie's in theater and when it comes out on home video. I, I just think it should be longer. I think it creates a better event atmosphere because honestly, this is just me. This is just my opinion, okay? This, this only applies to me. If you relate with this, great. If you don't, that's fine too. But for me, like Age of Ultron, which I really enjoyed, okay? Age of Ultron is in theaters. And then it's already out on home video, man. It's already out. And to, I still feel like I just saw it. To me, I feel like I just saw the damn movie. So when it comes out on Blu-ray, I don't, personally, I don't feel the need to run out and get it. I feel like I just watched it. However, if it came out, say, in January, it'll feel like it's been a while since I've seen it and now it's out on home video and I'm going to run out and get it. And that's just me. That's just the way my weird head works, whatever. But I honestly feel like the, the, the release window is too small. I think three months is too small. That's only 12 weeks. Just too small. Uh, I think it should be a wider uh, release date, but that's just me. So that's why. Because there's an agreement between the theaters and the studios because it would screw the theaters if it went straight to video and if, if it screws the theaters, it's ultimately going to screw to screw the studios too, because these movies make 10 times more money in theaters than they do on home video. In most cases, there are exceptions. Absolutely. There are, but uh, that's generally the thing. Um, and, and about that Steven Soderbergh thing, movies, theaters have a rule that there are movies that will come out in theaters. Usually it's about 20 of them, but they'll come out in theaters and be on home video on the same day. But mostly the theaters will not carry those movies because it screws them. Why, why should they, Support that movie. If you're just putting it right out on home video, why should a movie... Th you wouldn't do it. Um, no reason the theater should do it either because that screws them. So, yeah. So, there you go. Anyway, that'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining me on this Sunday edition of Collider Mailbag. Um, listen, uh, if you do, don't have it already bookmarked, you should absolutely bookmark Collider.com. It's the best website on, on the net for entertainment news. Head on over there, bookmarkcollider.com. And make sure you guys are following me on Twitter or on Facebook, at John Campy. You can see it right here. I often make a lot of announcements regarding um, movie talk and Collider video on my social media networks first before I do anywhere else. So make sure you're following me there, and I hope to see you on there. All right, guys, that'll do it for me. I'm heading down to Kamikaze for our panel there. I'm hoping you guys will come down a little bit later this afternoon and meet me there as well. So... My name is John Campia. Thanks for joining me, guys, and until next time, bye-bye.